Good evening, everyone. My name is Sandy Jones, and I'm the Director of Strategic Communications and Engagement at Colorado State University Global. I am pleased to welcome you to CSU Global's Career Success Webinar Series, kicking off today with tonight's event, Build Social Equity Brick by Brick, Learn from Lego, with superstar James Gregson, Digital Creative Director, Americas at Lego. Please note that this session will be recorded and all registered attendees will receive a recording after the event. We have a great program for you tonight and I'm excited to begin this evening's discussion. Before we get started, we wanna learn a little bit more about you. At the bottom of your screen, you'll notice a chat button there. Right now, I'd love for you to introduce yourself, tell us where you're Zooming from, share your major, your job, share what inspires you to be creative, why you're here, or just say hello. Just remember to select all panelists and attendees in the drop-down field. Also at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. At any time during the presentation, submit any questions you might have there and we'll answer as many of those as possible during the Q&A section at the end. Finally, after the webinar, we'll send each of you a copy of the recording of this evening's program. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our host for this evening, Dr. Lee Ann Walker. Dr. Walker has 15 years of professional experience in marketing, advertising, graphic design, and corporate branding for both nonprofit and for-profit organizations. She has provided marketing and design support for national and international organizations such as engineering, architectural design, transportation, professional supports, healthcare, and product man manufacturing. For the last 11 years, Dr. Walker has worked in higher education, and currently she's serving as the program director overseeing the undergraduate marketing and graduate marketing certificate programs at CSU Global. She holds quite a few degrees, a doctorate of business administration in marketing, a master of business administration in marketing, a master of business, uh, I'm sorry, and a bachelor of fine arts and graphic design, so many degrees. Many of you on the call know Dr. Walker, so please use the chat and join me in welcoming one of my favorite professors here at CSU Global, Dr. Leanne Walker. Thank you so much, Sandy. That was such a wonderful introduction. I'm so excited about our speaker series because I think it's important for students to hear from professionals in the field, sharing their journey and their transition into their careers. It seems fitting to start our 2021 speaker series off with a marketing leader for Lego because it's a brand that I admire and look up to. It's with great pleasure that I introduce you to our speaker this evening, James Gregson. Now I wanna share a bit about James. He began his career in non-traditional brand strategy. I'm looking so forward to hearing more about that this evening. Working at a series of marketing and communication agencies in and around New York City. Through his professional experience, he has built a combination of technical understanding and conceptual creativity to craft effective, measurable programs for clients and brands such as New Balance, Atari, and Mercedes-Benz. Currently, James is a digital creative director and leads a team of digital content strategists, creative designers, producers, and video editors within the Lego Group's internal creative agency. James was born in London, England, and spent his childhood living between New Jersey and the UK before coming to college in the United States. That must have been a different atmosphere. James holds a bachelor's in fine arts from Syracuse University. Please join me in welcoming James to the university. James, I will turn it over to you for your presentation and we are all excited to hear from you. There you go. I couldn't, I couldn't unmute myself and I can't turn on my camera. Can you en enable my camera too? And saying you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Let's see, there we go. Hi everybody. Hi. There you are. <laughs> All right, we're good to go. Um, hi everyone, thanks so much uh, for having me. I'm super excited to be here today. Let me just, uh, start sharing my screen um, and I can get on to the presentation. 
Let's see. All right, I hope. Let's go back. Hold on. Let's try again. Got a lot of technology. Let me try one more time. Share. It's loading. There we go. Right. I see it. Now, hopefully, you see. You don't see my notes. You see the the non notes version. And the dancing Lego. Yes, I love it. We see there it. There you go. All right. All right, we're good to go. Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, uh, I won't go into the details of who I am because we've done that a little bit. Um, but I will share a little bit about uh, my background and my journey. Um, it's certainly a sort of non-traditional journey, um, but a journey of, uh, you know, sort of honesty, passion, and definitely perseverance. Um, uh, uh, around that sort of pretty simple uh, desire, um, perseverance. Um, so, you know, I, I think it, this is around uh, one very simple um, fact. Uh, if I was gonna spend hundreds of hours uh, that we tend to do in our working life, um, it was super important that I figured out um, that I enjoyed doing what I was doing. Um, I knew that I had competitive competitiveness um, sort of in other characteristics that maybe wanted to, to develop and hone my craft um, to be successful. But um, I knew through sort of several learning experiences uh, in my sort of educational life uh, and beyond that I had to enjoy it. I know it sounds wildly simple, but that is what it is. Um, of course, as I go through this presentation, feel free to reach out to me, uh, uh, you know, in the chat um, or also uh, through social, uh, through Twitter, Instagram, uh, and LinkedIn at JLW Greg. So, a little bit, a little bit about me. Um, I want to share sort of my experience and my background, not to preach. That is definitely not uh, the purpose, um, but I want to take you all the way back, um, all the way back to the beginning uh, and, and why. Uh, because I think, you know, each of these sort of building blocks, as they are in the presentation, uh, were sort of critical foundational elements to who I am today uh, and how I've been able to um, impact things professionally, personally, et cetera. So uh, as it was mentioned, I was born in England uh, in the countryside about two hours south of London. Um, at the age of three, uh, my father, who was a corporate lawyer, got a job in New York City. And we moved our entire family um, across the Atlantic. Um, what uh, I later learned is that like around three years old is when uh, humans develop um, their accent uh, or their dialect. So living in New Jersey at the time with very British parents going to an all American school, um, I was one heck of a confused child. Um, <clears throat> after about eight wonderful years in the US, moved back to the UK um, and frankly, I was devastated. I left behind you know, uh, a life that I loved, close friends, sports culture that I had sort of essentially grown up in um, and moving from what was, uh, you know, sort of rural New Jersey to uh, the central London, um, that was a massive change, uh, a massive sort of culture shock uh, that I sort of needed to, to weather the storm of. Um, and, you know, at that time, I, I, I looking back at it, I was completely lost, um, falling between sort of traditional education systems uh, and an inter international sort of education system. Um, you know, uh, it was sort of sort of around this moment that I really sort of found sports um, as my sort of true love. I was sort of an athletic kid, um, but it really just started getting into the sort of the whole camaraderie of, and what uh, teamwork could bring uh, to sports. Um, it really didn't even matter what sport it was. I, I sort of loved them all. Um, but school, frankly, was a serious challenge. Um, I had poor grades, poor grades, <laughs> um, always did, but I worked hard. I always worked hard, um, but I was sort of frustrated. Um, you know, I, I worked hard, but I was sort of a, a standard C, C student. Um, I never got an A. In fact, the first A I ever got was when I went to college. Um, I enjoyed sort of tactile things, so um, art class, um, any sort of design uh, feature. Um, 
And, you know, what I sort of struggled with was it didn't matter how hard I tried, you know, what subject it was, I struggled. Um, and I was sort of really eager to sort of figure out and find my value. So leading up to college, I followed what everyone else was doing, you know, visiting colleges, considering my major. This was a very different time to what it is now. So I'm not saying follow this path what, at all. I'm just sharing this for, for greater context. Um, it was around sort of 16, 17 when I had my first inter internship. I shadowed someone at uh, a stock photography business uh, in London. Um, and, you know, it sparked that desire in me, um, which was to get ahead. You know, I thought at that time I was like, you know, forget college. I just wanted to, to start my career um, in what I had no clue, no idea. Um, you know, I wasn't studious. I didn't have that sort of that level of knowledge of what I wanted to do. Um, but that's where my head was at that time. Um, I knew then <clears throat> when I had a conversation with my dad, I remember sitting vividly, um, sitting in the kitchen. Uh, and um, I remember him uh, sort of explaining to me, um, you know, I was pushing saying I didn't want to go to college. I wanted to get started in my career immediately. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and he kindly reminded me that I have the rest of my life to work. Um, and if I could find a cost-effective way to go to college, I should. Um, if not anything but to delay working for the rest of my life, <laughs> which, you know, I guess at face value wouldn't, you know, be such a, a terrible idea. But it was certainly a sort of a, a defining moment for me. Um, again, I'll caveat, this is a different time. It wasn't that long ago, but it, it's a different time now. Um, again, I'm sharing this to shape you know, where, where and how I got to where I was. So I decided to go to college, um, but I decided to leave, the, uh, leave England um, and go to college in the US. Um, and that was uh, at the time to, to play soccer. Um, I used soccer as a, as a way to fund my sort of college education. Um, I had no intention ever to you know, play professional soccer, soccer. I was never gonna be that good, um, but, uh, I basically, I took the year off between uh, high school and college um, in the UK that were in Europe, that's called a gap year and studied to take my SATs. Um, I tried to play as many soccer leagues as possible uh, and it paid off. I ended up, uh, you know, getting uh, an offer to go to Syracuse University, which was, um, you know, as it turns out, a great opportunity. Um, you know, I started off study, studying uh, advertising design, which funnily enough is exactly what I do now. Um, but quickly got bored. And I, when I say quickly, I mean, I lasted three months. <laughs> um, I quickly got bored, disengaged with the, the whole process, the creative process of that class. I didn't enjoy it um, and it showed. Um, I honestly was on academic probation after the first semester. Um, and, you know, I had another conversation uh, with my parents and I vividly remember this one as well, where, you know, I talked about how, uh, you know, I struggled to motivate myself for something that I didn't enjoy doing. Um, and I think, you know, I, I assume everyone has been there. Everyone has dealt with that. Um, and I sort of came to the decision that, uh, you know, in sort of this discussion, I came to this idea that, you know, in order to succeed, I needed to focus on what I uh, enjoyed doing, regardless of the transferable nature of those skills. Um, you know, that I picked along the way, right? I was never going to be a doctor. I was never going to be a lawyer. Um, so oddly, I decided uh, to be, to choose a major of computer animation with a minor uh, in painting. Go figure. Um, I have done neither of those since I graduated college. Um, you know, I was never going to get a job at Pixar, but I enjoyed the creative process of physically making something, both with my computer and my hands. And that to me, uh, was inspiring, an aspiring opportunity to sort of, to, to really focus and hopefully uh, achieve success in my eyes. Um, you know, and to that end, I finally felt like I was in the right place. I was engaged, my work ethic uh, was the same. I still worked hard, but I finally felt like I was doing what I was meant to do in, in some regard. Um, you know, that desire, uh, you know, to succeed really, you know, that I sort of, had defined in that internship, you know, really started uh, to, to kick itself into gear, um, <clears throat> you know, and, you know, every summer I was looking for internships. 
you know, I, for as many college credits as I could get, I was desperately looking for internships, um, you know, and building that network, you know, but at the same time, I was still, you know, I was a soccer coach at a soccer camp. I worked at a tourism company. I worked for a news distribution business, an ad agency, anyone who would hire me to some extent, uh, I would, would take on that opportunity. Um, and I think, you know, the most important part of these internships was, you know, learning about maybe what I didn't like more so than what I did like. Um, you know, and that's uh, as equally important to this entire process for me. Um, you know, I, I was still very uncertain of what I was going to do professionally. I had no clue. I remember, um, you know, being roommates with two guys who both knew they were going to go into finance from day one. One was going to be an accountant and the other one wanted to be an investment and they knew, you know, and I was you know, clueless and that sort of really built, <laughs> built half anxiety and half desire to sort of figure it out. Um, but it was through one of those internships where, you know, uh, I struck gold, um, and I was in college when, uh, Facebook was a thing, um, by a thing, I mean, where Facebook rolled out, um, at that time, and I'm going to date myself, it was only available to people in college. Um, and I was working at an internship in New York city, um, when the head of a publicly traded uh, well-known agency was walking through the halls talking about a new business opportunity about a UK based social network, um, that wanted to launch in the U S. Um, and I vividly remember walking past my cubicle that I was sharing with like three other people as, um, you know, a good little worker bee. Um, and she was like, what's a social network? Um, this was like 15 years ago. So like that's a reasonable question to ask. Um, and I got real brave. <laughs> I, this woman had no idea who I was, um, nor should she. Um, and I heard her say, what is a social network? I sent her an email immediately saying that I knew everything there was to know about this social network, uh, being that it was UK based and I'm British. Um, and I knew about social networks, um, you know, uh, and frankly, I knew nothing. I knew not a peep about either. I mean, I knew about social networks because I went to college with Facebook. So I figured I knew what a social network was, um, but I had never heard of this thing. So I remember, so I sent probably about 20 emails to friends in the UK asking like, someone tell me about this thing. What do you know? I know nothing, um, you know, give me the detail. So kind of long story short, um, I was invited to join this new business pitch as an intern. I was given a fake title, a bio, and I was, you know, surprising to me an active participant in that meeting. Um, and, you know, sort of what a blast that was for me as someone that, you know, didn't really expect any of that going in. And that sort of really ignited uh, that passion and that desire that I, you know, had always um, had in me, you know, and I quickly learned that I had a voice to be had amongst you know many other people um, who maybe not, were not so knowledgeable on a topic that I felt naturally knowledgeable of. Um, so I found joy in sort of sharing my opinions on a matter uh, that few a few people in the room sort of seemed to truly have knowledge of. Um, and you know, fast forward, I grad graduated with uh, a reasonable, not great GPA, but I graduated nonetheless um, in four years. Um, and I graduated uh, and started my career uh, working in PR. Um, again, I had a major in computer animation and a minor in painting. I did not have a communications major. Um, it was those internships and the experience that I built that at that time was far more valuable um, than uh, the specific major that I chose. Again, I'm not preaching that that's how you should approach things. I'm just sharing that from the context. I can see, Leanne, you're probably shaking in your seat, but um, I apologize. <laughs> um, but, and, you know, working, I was working in sort of a digital communication team uh, within uh, a PR agency. Um, the team I joined was honestly ideal for me. Uh, you know, it was working on ways to sort of leverage digital channels to extend or amplify, you know, a communications message. And, you know, I was, very lucky to work with someone early on in my career who was not only a great leader, um, but she really sort of set a great example of what a mentor uh, is. Uh, she was kind, honest, direct, um, 
And, you know, I've taken a lot of those characteristics forward in my professional career. Um, you know, we had a small, very sort of tight knit team and I was able to be on the ground floor of developing, you know, a team within a, a, a large global agency with sort of 70 offices around the globe. Um, and it was, you know, it, it was a very exciting time, time. Uh, you know, with working on a sort of a new team with that sort of large global footprint, I learned very quickly the value of networking. Um, you know, and I did my absolute best to connect with like-minded people every day. You know, it was a critical part of my job, but not only that, I sort of very quickly saw the value that it brought uh, to me as an individual, but also uh, not only just to my job. You know, and I continue to grow and learn. I worked with different types of agencies, privately owned, you know, small sort of startup styles, uh, you know, specific boutique agencies. Uh, and about 70 years or so into my career, I sort of hit what felt like a sort of fair, a fairly familiar roadblock. Um, the hours were long, the economy was on a downturn, and I was being asked to deliver more with less resources. Um, and I hit my limit. I delivered the type of work that I wanted. Uh, uh, I, I could deliver the type of work I wanted, but I wasn't, uh, you know, being able to deliver the, the level of sort of client management that I was, that I was truly proud of. Um, so I took the ultimate risk. Again, another thing that I wouldn't recommend you ever do. Um, I decided to go out on my own. Um, I knew nothing about entrepreneurship. Um, and I did you know, the absolute thing that I would recommend no one ever do professionally, which was quit without a plan or without another job. Um, you know, but I know I was no longer enjoying what I was doing and that was impacting um, my work, um, ignoring the, the personal stuff of that. Um, you know, and maybe under the worst economic uh, circumstances ever, uh, the subprime mortgage crisis hit about two, month, two months after I started, decided to go out on my own and quit my business, uh, and quit my, my agency job uh, with full health care and benefits and all that sort of stuff and started my own business. Um, you know, but as an entrepreneur that I sort of quickly figured out, um, there's nothing more empowering than being in control of your own destiny. Um, there's nothing, also nothing more terrifying. Um, and no, just to clarify, did not have a Porsche. I wish I had a Porsche, um, as an entrepreneur. Um, while, while it brought sort of a very different type of stress, um, it was, you know, being an entrepreneur, it was very different from agency life. You know, it was, uh, at the time, it was a much more empowering type of stress and energy uh, than it was, you know, the type of stress that led me to sort of quit, frankly. Um, but I knew I wanted to do it differently, uh, you know, rather than my old agency days of working with the same people with the same set of skills. So I built teams around the requirements of each project, um, you know, the, the people with unique specific backgrounds to deliver the work, um, you know, and I continued to grow my network. Uh, you know, to this day, um, networking is probably the biggest skill that I've taken on. And literally 10 minutes before this meeting um, or before this presentation, I reached out to someone who I haven't spoken to in months asking for their uh, subjective advice on my career and some general thoughts. Um, you know, and that wasn't a planned thing. I just thought, he came up across my LinkedIn feed and I just thought, this is a good idea. Let's, let's reach out, reach out to him. You know, he commented on a post that I shared. Um, it's a good idea to connect, you know, and I set those rules with myself. Um, you know, when I had my, my, my own business, you know, I, I made sure that I was reaching out to someone new who I didn't know on a daily basis or didn't communicate on a daily basis. I was reaching out to someone new every week on LinkedIn and I wasn't, doing the whole sell, 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 sell. I was doing my very best to connect with them on a personal level um, and sort of build up that network. Um, and, you know, through that network, quite frankly, uh, that's how I got to where uh, I am today, right? Um, I got connected to Lego's PR agency um, through my old boss's friend that recommended me to build her website. Um, and, uh, long story short, I started, I built their website and then started, uh, sort of helping them on other projects and that spiraled. And, uh, after two years of a sort of a 
a project-based working relationship with them. They brought me onto a Lego project. Um, and then two years after that, I had done about four different Lego projects and got asked to join, um, join Lego. So um, fast forward five years, uh, I've been at Lego now for just over five years. Um, as we said, I am the, uh, the creative director for one of the, the most creative brands in the world, which is a pinch yourself. The eight-year-old version of myself has no idea how lucky I am. Um, I will caveat that it is still a job. Today especially was a very challenging day. It was very stressful, um, but uh, you know, it, it is an incredible brand to, to work for. Um, and I am very humbled on a daily basis uh, by that. So I just wanted to sort of switch gears a little bit uh, and so sort of talk about how um, I get inspired. Um, you know, I think uh, inspiration uh, is a massive part of my job. It's a massive part of who uh, I need to be and how I need to inspire uh, people, um, especially in these sort of remote working environments that we seem to find ourselves in. Um, sort of, and as this minifigure uh, animation suggests, although he stopped moving, um, you know, we are all very, very busy, right? We are all consuming so much information uh, in a given day, in a given hour. Um, it's very difficult to sort of dedicate time to inspiration. Um, so I want to sort of share a little bit about how I go about getting sort of inspired in my day to day. Um, right. There are obvious sources. Anyone that is in the marketing space should know about all of these places. I highly recommend that you visit them and even subscribe to a traditional actual magazine version of these, if you will. Some of them do actually have a magazine. Um, <clears throat> I'm saying that somewhat facetiously. Um, you know, uh, I could spend hours on these sites, um, right? Um, and they are definitely sort of my go-to resources um, and, you know, the catch-all obvious places to go. Um, so I would definitely start with them there. Um, then sort of another odd place of inspiration, certainly in social media and sort of digital marketing, um, the fast food category. I mean, uh, wow. Uh, you know, with my focus being social media, um, you know, the fast food category has sort of really taken hold of social media and, and ran with it to a level that uh, it is really wild. Um, so I highly rock recommend sort of following, uh, you know, those brands in this space that are doing really, really, uh, I say great work. Um, you know, I think the most recent example of Burger King, um, if you Google Burger King within the news section, I'm sure you'll see probably a ill-advised campaign. Um, but up until then, you know, a lot of these brands have done some wildly interesting, wildly successful um, award-winning work. Um, and this image here is the, the image of the, uh, Burger King's Moldy Whopper. Um, again, just a sort of inspiring category, a, a category that does some very risky, very in your face things um, that are certainly very interesting. Um, you know, I don't think this should, this should be that big of a surprise, but you know, you know, diversity and inclusion has sort of taken center stage, um, you know, last year and into this year, um, you know, so I'm eager to look into brands that, that use that as, uh, you know, a tent pole of their communication, um, you know, and honestly, it's something that Lego needs to do a, a better job of, um, you know, so looking at the likes of Nike and the likes of Ben and Jerry's who do, you know, just incredible work in this space, um, you know, they are, very aspirational and very inspirational for us creatively, uh, you know, and inform a lot of our, uh, our, our creative decision making. Um, then, uh, you know, a, a little non-traditional uh, angle here. You know, there's, and recently I just posted something on LinkedIn today about this, um, you know, working in social media is a challenging thing to do, uh, certainly in this day and age. Um, you know, the, the uh, term being always on is, is a reality, um, you know, because, you know, the moment my strike at, at, you know, at any time, um, and we do, if we're working in social, you have to be always on. Um, but I would flip that a little bit and say, that feels like an awful lot of pressure. Um, you know, I, I try to, certainly as I look at it, look um, to, you know, things like creative inspiration, 
I look to gain inspiration from everywhere, from every sources, not just in my day to day at work. Um, you know, and you know, honestly, I'm a huge YouTube consumer personally. Um, right. I love YouTube. Um, yes, it is a part of my job, but I spend a lot of personal time on there. Um, and I am constantly considering why I, as a user, am making decisions that I make in my YouTube, on my personal YouTube experience, right? So for the moment that I open up YouTube, I am thinking about why are these videos showing up in the algorithm on my homepage? Why is this one ahead of this one? What is interesting about this thumbnail that is making me touch it and open it and watch it over another video. Now, obviously, I'm that sounds a little bit all encompassing, a little overwhelming. It kind of happens in the background, I will say, because you know having that natural curiosity um, is critically important. And you know, we talk about um, a number of sort of criteria for uh, new employees at Lego, and curiosity is one of the three. Um, natural curiosity is critically important, certainly to creativity, because it shows that you're willing to challenge the status quo. It shows that you're willing to dig into something and, and try and understand the answer why. Um, and that's massively important from my perspective to the, to the creative experience. Um, so that just going to a little bit of sort of explanation here, right? So um, I don't know if any of you guys have followed this. This is uh, Hot Ones. This is a YouTube series uh, that I take great pride in the fact that like I started watching this when they were well below a million subscribers. Um, and, um, you know, I, what I find fascinating about this is there's nothing revolutionary about this. Right. This is an interview, a celebrity interview concept. We've seen this. This format has existed since TV existed. Um, what they have done is put a, a very entertaining spin on it, right? With the fandom around wings and hot sauce and the style of the interview, it just creates a massively interesting format. And if you think about this, the production value of this is low. It's a black room, right? It's a tiny studio, and it is the same format churned out time after time after time after time. And clearly it's working. They've got 7 million subscribers here. I think they're up to 10 now at this point. Um, you know, and I, again, I look at this content from a personal standpoint because I find it so interesting. I find it, uh, you know, engaging, and I'm constantly trying to understand why I, as a consumer, am engaging in this content and consuming this content. And then I take what those assumptions and learnings and insights that I have and try to apply those in my, my professional life. Um, you know, sort of another example, um, I don't know if any of you ever knew what Bon Appetit was, um, but they were traditionally a magazine that I saw at my grandmother's house. Um, it was a magazine that she greatly looked forward to, uh, that she used to, you know, bookmark and tear pages out. Um, and um, doing my best to ignore, they have had some pretty serious um, diversity uh, indiscretions, um, but trying my best to ignore this is an interesting creative example. Um, you know, they were, um, for better or for worse, an old person's brand. Um, you know, and they came up with this wildly creative strategy um, to create uh, a YouTube specific um, content strategy for the audience that is on YouTube. That is not the audience that is on Bon Appetit, as I understand it. Um, again, I, I don't know the sort of back end story here, um, you know, but there's an entire uh, content stream here, you'll see at the bottom here, where it's called Gourmet Makes, where this poor chef um, basically tries to recreate gourmet versions of real food. Um, and they're like 30 minute long videos. Um, the chefs are the talent and you know, I get into this whole dialogue, internal dialogue of like, this is a fa fantastically interesting strategy. Bon Appetit is obviously trying to extend their audience reach, not to just, you know, my grandmother or my mother, but to a younger audience, right? The, the middle, bottom mid middle video here is, um, you know, one of their chefs trying to recreate a gourmet Pop-Tart. 
I mean, if the audience isn't obvious there, um, you know, and if you go into these videos, um, and maybe I can pull one of them up in a second, um, you know, if you go into these videos, it is, you know, wow, she goes on like a 20 day tear of trying to perfect a gourmet version of this recipe, right? So I'm going through this entire diatribe of trying to understand like, okay, so the chef is the talent, the talent is the employee, the employee is coming up with the idea, right? That's a very sort of non-traditional way of creating content, right? Or trading, creating video content. You usually have the talent, you've got a producer, you've got, you know, uh, a, a director, you've got, you know, a, a script writer, you've got all these sort of components. And this is YouTube content made specifically for YouTube by what was a previously a very polished brand. Um, so I always, you know, as I said, I watch this content because it entertains me. Um, again, not because I'm trying to, uh, you know, do some sort of professional research, but I can't help that curiosity in me can't help try and figure out and solve, um, you know, why am I, why am I engaging in this content? Why do I find it so interesting? What is it that makes it interesting to other people? I highly recommend you check them out. I, I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, so uh, switching gears onto podcasts, uh, I will say since uh, working from home since March of last year, um, I've probably listened to about an hour and a half worth of podcasts versus um, when I had a, an hour and change commute, no, two hours commute a day, I was churning through well over two hours of podcasts every day, right? And I was just a source of information, less so now um, because I live where I work and I work where I live, not the healthiest environment. Um, but they are an incredibly interesting resource. Again, I'm going to use the same example here of none of these are work related. These are all curiosity inspired, um, right? So the first example here is Snacks Daily, which is, I'm going to read it for you, right? It's a digestible, digestible financial news. Get uh, smarter fast with an entertaining breakdown of our top three business stories in 15 minutes. Pairs perfectly with your commute, work, workout, or morning oatmeal routine uh, ritual, right? I'm not in finance. I have very limited connection to finance. Lego is a privately owned company. There's very little that I need to know by the, about the financial world. Yet, if I can get a lot of information on a daily basis in 15 minutes that makes me smarter, I'm all for it. Right, and I think you know. I highly recommend um, you check them out, just because it, it it is super interesting. It's really quick. It's consumable. It's not an hour long plus storytelling experience. Right, that in itself is an interesting strategy. That in of itself is an interesting content strategy. Right, fifteen minutes worth of financial news on a daily basis that hooked me in right away. Um, you know, and it's less so about the, the content every day and it's more about you know, the, the promise that they're trying to deliver. Um, moving on to Freakonomics. Um, this is a podcast from uh, the author behind a, a very well-known book. Um, again, I'll read the description here. Discover the hidden side of everything with Stephen J. Dubner, co-author of Freakonomics books. Each week, Freakonomics Radio tells you things you always thought you knew, but didn't, and things you never thought you wanted to know, but do. From the economics of sleep uh, to how to become great at just about anything, Dubner speaks with the Nobel laureates and provocateurs, intellectuals and entrepreneurs and various other uh, underachievers. Um, right, this is a much different proposition. This is a long form podcast, but they go into detail and research on topics that you would never come across in your daily life, right? And I find it fascinating to, you know, fill that sort of knowledge bank of information, right? Some of it useless, some of it may be useful. Again, it speaks to that idea of curiosity. Um, I, these guys sort of very specifically take a very interesting angle at common problems and look to solve it. And I find that fascinating. Um, then maybe a little off color for some, but this is a, a Barstool podcast uh, called Pardon My Take. Um, ignoring your opinions on what you think about Barstool. Um, I enjoy this specific podcast. Uh, it, it's uh, 
good sports information um, for me. Um, with three kids, I don't get to watch a lot of sports, but I love sports. Um, and again, I'm consuming this on my personal time. I, I'm engaging this with this on my personal time, but they do a lot of advertising buys. They do a lot of um, advertising integration um, and they do it in a very real, very honest way, right? And I take great inspiration from that, trying to understand what does the advertising model look like in podcasts, right? My assumption is, um, right, that everyone who's listening to a podcast, when an ad comes up, they fast forward, right? So what is the creative solve to that? Um, how do you integrate that into the storyline? Um, how do you in integrate the advertiser into uh, you know, the, the podcast segment so that it makes it harder to, to fast forward through it. Um, and they do some really interesting things with that. Um, not all the time, but sometimes. Um, and again, I, I gain inspiration from that. Um, so in to sort of start sharing some work, the actual TV, um, although I'll lie, some of this stuff is from YouTube. Um, so I wanted to share some examples uh, of work that Again, it comes across in uh, my my daily life. So we'll hope the share. Billy Jean King serving. shared that example like 20 times and I still get goosebumps from it, um, right? That was a YouTube pre-roll ad, right? That was an ad that showed up on my personal consumption <laughs> uh, of video. Um, and not only did I watch the whole thing, um, I sought out the backstory behind it, right? And again, that points to, yes, I'm in advertising, yes, my team is responsible for creating YouTube pre-roll ads, absolutely. But as a consumer, I found that wildly interesting. And I'm going to make you guys watch it again because I want you to think about from a create content creation standpoint, think about what was original in any of this, um, right? This wasn't a traditional TV ad, so we'll just watch it again. I don't know this uh, concretely, but I know that you the, the New York Times has uh, an in-house uh, production agency that likely cost them zero dollars, zero dollars, right? To create a wildly impactful piece of content, uh, an ad. Maybe they had to pay a tiny little segment for that audio clip, like a teeny tiny piece, um, you know, but just a really, really creatively inspiring um, message that really focuses on copy, really succinct editing, um, again, probably for a budget that costs next to nothing. Um, then for a more recent example, oh, it's going to go we don't need to go again. Um, then I'm going to share uh, this example from the Super Bowl, um, which is uh, my favorite example uh, from the Super Bowl ads. So I'll just take you through this. It's a YouTube video, so maybe. In the heartland. Bonkers, right? So this was a Super Bowl commercial from this year. Um, you know, and you know, uh, uh, quick background, right? In case you were maybe living under a rock. So no shame if you were, it's okay. Um, you know, this statement referred to Reddit's role uh, sort of in disrupting the financial markets, most notably around uh, AMC and GameStop. So I just wanna read it quickly. Um, wow, this actually worked. If you're reading this, it means our bet paid off. Big game spots are expensive, so we couldn't buy a full one, but we were inspired and decided to spend our entire marketing budget on five seconds of airtime. One thing we learned from our uh, communities last week 
is that underdogs can accomplish just about anything when they come together around a common idea. Who knows, maybe you'll be the reason finance textbooks have to add a chapter on attendees. Maybe you'll help subreddit Super, uh, Super Bowl uh, teach the world about the majesty of owls. Maybe you'll even pause this five second ad. Powerful things happen when people rally around something they really care about and there's place for that. It's called Reddit. If you think about what it costs to create a Super Bowl ad um, and the background of this, uh, the background of this was it created, they decided to move ahead with this uh, a week before the Super Bowl. Um, it costs them $187,000 a second um, for a seven second ad, I think it was. Um, the ad was banking on the fact that people would pause the ad to get the payoff, right? I don't think anyone's paused an ad during the Super Bowl. I don't think anyone's paused anything during the Super Bowl. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know, um, right? That's a wildly risky bet. Um, but from my perspective, it paid off and it paid off because it was different. Um, and in the world of Super Bowl ads, uh, I think we welcomed different um, because they, over the long longest time have sort of all felt the same. Um, so again, I find that wildly inspiring, um, wildly risky, wildly brave, all things that uh, in some cases, you know, uh, result in great creative work. Not all the time, not all the time. Um, and then some final for thoughts before uh, we, we sort of move into um, <clears throat> some, some Q and A um, from wildly obscure sources. Um, oddly, uh, I'm a big fan of kayak camping. Um, I've only done it like a handful of times, um, but I am a huge fan of it. I don't know why. I think there's some combination of camping and being on the water that I'm all in for. Um, and, you know, going back to that idea that inspiration comes from anywhere and it doesn't usually come from work. Um, I was researching a trip uh, that I uh, am doing with a buddy this summer. Um, and I came across this uh, paragraph from uh, a blog about kayak camping on the Delaware River. Um, so I just want to read you the, the full quote. Um, the first half of the day was incredibly peaceful. What, did, what is it about water that just quiets the mind and makes us so calm? I get a lot of thinking done in that quiet calm. It reminded me of when I was younger, before smartphones. Sometimes you would just be bored. And in a way, that was a good thing. It allowed your mind to wander. New ideas would pop up, sparking new mini epiphanies. Mini epiphanies, a short term stolen from a friend. It's odd. We pretty much have the entire aggregate of human knowledge at our fingertips, accessible to us at all times. But we spend so much time, so much less time thinking to stave off boredom. We just scroll. Maybe that's why I like backpacking so much. It allows me to disconnect and get bored, leaving plenty of breathing room to think and ponder. Right, so my ending thought would be, I think we all need to get a little bit more comfortable of being more bored um, and using boredom to inspire free thinking rather than um, going on social and starving off boredom. That's coming from someone that works in social. So um, that's it. That's the, the presentation. Um, thanks so much for your time. I think we're going to open it up to a Q&A. So I will uh, stop sharing. That sounds great. Thank you so much. That was so informative. I can relate to you on so many levels. It was almost scary. <laughs> that was fantastic. So we have a lot of questions that came through in the chat. So let's tackle a few of these. But first, I want to know, did you play with Legos as a kid? I was obsessed with Lego as a kid. Yeah, absolutely obsessed. Um, <laughs> in other presentations, I used to always share that like my fondest memories with my father was playing Lego um, until a few people said, oh, I'm so sorry that your father passed away. And I was like, no, 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 my father's alive. Sorry, I made it sound like. Um, so yes, I, long story short, I absolutely loved playing with Lego. Um, I got a ping pong table as a kid. Uh, like when I was six or seven, and I think I played ping uh, ping pong through until New Year's, and then it was a, a Lego table. Um, but it quickly stopped. I did not 
play with Lego after like the age of 12, 13, 14, whatever it was, um, and really didn't get back into it, obviously, from behind me, um, <laughs> <laughs> until I started working there again. That's awesome, because I do see all those Legos behind you, which leads us to our first question. Does Lego take a different marketing and design approach when it comes to identifying and targeting adults who are avid collectors and builders, such as myself, versus the younger audience who like to play with Legos as a product? Absolutely. Uh, yes. Um, you know, I think, to be honest, um, adults weren't really a target customer uh, or a large scale target customer, to be very honest, until a few years ago. Uh, we had a few products that were obviously very dedicated uh not dedicated, you know, were targeted towards them, you know, look at any set over 200, $300, that is a, a set targeting an adult in most cases. Um, but, you know, you'll see larger, you know, more and more larger price point sets, uh, because certainly after COVID, we have gained a massive amount of adult fans, adult fans that are not parents. Um, I will say that, um, the uh, build and display type fans like myself here um, are not our ideal fans. And I say that uh, probably incorrectly. Um, you know, the core proposition and value proposition of, of the Lego brick, right, is for it to be built and rebuilt, right? I use this example all the time. These are some bricks. This is my iPhone stand, right? Like, <laughs> and, and that's not what it was built for. Ah, I'm dropping things. That's not what it was built for, but like, that's how I use it. Um, and that is the core proposition of Lego was for it to be built and rebuilt. And we have an entire brand platform that speaks to that. And that is definitely sort of uh, the, the sole, not the sole purpose, but a, a large part of our, our marketing goes into that concept of building and rebuilding. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of in, earlier in your presentation, you had talked about um, hitting a roadblock. Yeah. So what advice would you give to a new brand that's launching in a saturated market where they could increase exposure? Say that again, sorry, I was just thinking. So in terms of a new brand that's launching in a saturated market, Okay. What advice could you give them to increase their exposure? Good question. Okay. Uh, I think as a general rule of thumb, certainly if you look at digital and social, we, we as a general rule, we uh, tend to spread ourselves too thin, right? You look across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, there's all these platforms that you could potentially reach audiences and create content for. Um, I think as a smaller brand with less budget, you're far better off focusing on your most important audience segment, understanding where they live and focusing on a platform and a format in support of that. That is far going to be far more effective than creating a bunch of average to poor pieces of content across multiple social channels um, versus the other way around. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. That's actually advice that I would give a student. <laughs> That's awesome. yeah. Okay, so you mentioned making real connections via social media. We've all had those networking requests. Somebody wants to connect with you on LinkedIn and then they hit you with that sales pitch. You can time some of them. You can get some within under a minute where they want to take 10 to 15 minutes of your time. So thinking about those networking tips, um, mm. how, how do you go about networking if you're shy or you just don't engage in the small talk? I don't engage in the small talk. I hate the small talk. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're shy, it's tough. I'm not going to lie. Uh, it is tough. But LinkedIn is the great, you know, uh, digital is the great equalizer, right? Because you can fake that shyness through text pretty easily. Um, what I would say is uh, be honest be genuine. Um, you know, I have a little, I'm going to give it away now. Um, I have a little rule of thumb. I, I am open to speaking to anyone at any time. Um, but 
I am busy, right? My calendar on a daily day basis, Lego loves a good meeting and I have meetings in meetings <laughs> all day long day. Um, right. So a general rule of thumb is if someone wants, you know, and I, in the time of COVID when a lot of people are losing their job, um, you know, I, I posted something on LinkedIn that said, Hey, you know, if there's anything that I can do, if you want to connect with me for 30 minutes, um, reach out, let me know. I'm happy to, to, you know, just talk through something. Um, and so I, you know, I, I did that, um, and a lot of people reached out. Great. That was ex what I wanted. Um, but it became honestly a little bit, little bit immanageable, right? So what I end up doing, um, and none of you can share this, <laughs> um, is that I tell people, you know, sorry, I'm super busy, um, right now, but, you know, reach back to me in a week, uh, sh sh and I'll, can sh you know, share my availability with you, um, you know, and we'll, we'll, you know, set up a zoom conversation right that right there very quickly shuffles out the those that want it and the, those that kind of want it mm -hmm. um and it feels a little bit cheap doing it but also you know i've got to be honest with my time and that i am literally opening up my doors to anybody literally anybody that wants it um and you know i've connected with some great people uh you know through that process um you know, and I think it, it's, it's definitely been an exercise that's worked. Mm -hmm. I think for me, my approach has been to connect with people. And then I sit back and I watch, I watch what they post about yeah. um, what they share. And then I find ways to make that connection with them based on a mutual shared common interest. Yeah. So I, I, I like that approach. Um, let's go with this other question. Um, of everything you've done with Lego, what has been your favorite campaign or project? Goodness. Um, man. Um, I mean, I'd really like to say the one that, uh, failed yesterday, uh, because I think it was the most aggressive uh challenging one uh but i can't share too many details about that Ooh. um so i think you know the biggest most exciting program that i've probably worked on um goodness i'm trying to think of what the right odds on answer would be for this audience to be frank so i recently launched we recently developed a program called lego build day uh which is basically a an, an attempt to try and to create a May the 4th, Disney's May the 4th, Star Wars's May the 4th-esque type event uh, on uh, December 26th, um, you know, un unboxing day, if you will, for Lego, um, being that a large majority of people are, um, you know, not just Christmas uh, goers, that's probably not the right term, uh, not just people that, um, you know, celebrate Christmas. Um, it is a, you know, a large period of building. Um, you know, we know that from, from research. Uh, so we basically created a, you know, uh, on Twitter, an occasion around um, this sort of somewhat forced, somewhat, uh, you know, very insight driven, uh, you know, occasion that families um, and family time during COVID um, is it's specially increased. Um, and then, you know, tenfold when you think about right, right after the holidays, um, you know, and yeah, so it was a, a super successful, exciting campaign that we did. It was supposed to be, you know, social only on Twitter predominantly. Um, and the creative that we pulled together, albeit over a weekend at one point, um, ended up running as a holiday ad in the UK on TV on Christmas Day, which is like Christmas Day TV in England is like a religious experience. Not that there's religious TV. It's just a very like traditional experience. The Christmas TV lineup is very strong. Um, so, you know, I think that was a personal highlight moment for me. Um, you know, I think I'll still look back uh, at, you know, smaller one-off, um, you know, pieces of content that we've created on social that has, you know, you know, had a really good impact. 
um, you know, or, you know, our most recent sort of celebration and acknowledgement of, uh, you know, Black uh, creators um, for Black History Month. You know, we, we traditionally are, uh, you know, a non-racial, uh, you know, brand. Our, our minifigures are all yellow. Um, but we felt that we needed a response. We had a responsibility as a brand to show up for Black History Month um, in the right way. Um, and that was celebrating our, you know, our, our fans um, that were also Black. So I think I'm sort of really excited about and proud of how that sort of came to fruition from a, you know, a Danish-based company that, you know, honestly has a lot of work to do in terms of diversity and inclusion and is a big element of what we're pushing for. Um, so yeah, those would be two vastly different examples. Awesome. Those are great. So in terms of, because this is always something that we like to discuss in higher education in our classes with our students, are the different softwares or platforms that you use to maybe do data analytics or content hmm. creation? Do you have favorite ones that you use at LEGO? Uh, I definitely do. Um, we actually don't use them at Lego, but I wish we did. Um, you know, I think uh, tools like Brandwatch um, and tools like uh, TalkWalker um, are definitely the strongest from a, a listening and analytics standpoint. Um, they do a great job of visualizing data in a way that um, not only people that work in digital understand. Um, and that Honestly, when you start working at a, 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 a large scale business that is global, that has multiple different touch points that not all people are, you know, digital natives, um, that becomes increasingly important. So those two do the best at sort of visualization of data. Um, I think from a general standpoint, there is no better way to, under to understand what's going on than to use these platforms, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't matter who you are um, and how much you hate Mark Zuckerberg or how much you don't want your data out there. Um, using the platforms, experiencing the platforms is the best way to understand what works, what doesn't, what resonates, what doesn't, what's hot, what's not, mm -hmm. right? And I, I, I say that with TikTok, right? Like, I have no right to be on TikTok, no right. I am the definition of not cool, right? And not cool enough for TikTok, but TikTok is the cool filter, right? For all things, you know, brand related, TikTok is the cool filter, right? And you can see that from like a recent example I just shared, you know, internally from Coors Light doing a TV commercial, TV commercial based off a TikTok trend. Right, that's bonkers to think. TikTok has not been around that long to be inspiring TV advertising. Mm -hmm. I know my my daughter's world ended when they started blocking those under the age of thirteen because she's eight. So her her world ended when that happened. Um, it was all out big girl tears. <laughs> yes. So looking at um, your journey in college and after college, are there things that you know now that you would give advice to people that are now in college that they should begin to do early? Maybe some of that networking, uh, maybe some of those explorations of those platforms. What advice would you give based on what you know, because hindsight's twenty twenty? would you give to college students that are making their way through this journey now? Yeah, so good question. I mean, I think, listen, I, I shared a lot of that in this presentation and that was honestly, you know, the purpose of the presentation was to give a little bit of insight of that. You know, I think um, it's super easy to be demoralized. It's super easy to be, to, you know, be demoralized with the, the interview process and, you know, e even as an intern, intern um, you know, but perseverance, you know, those sort of characteristics are absolutely critical to one's professional success. It doesn't matter if you work at a Fortune 500 company with 100,000 employees or you are a startup trying to make your first sale. Perseverance is going to get you everywhere. Um, and, 
you know, better for worse, I have that in spades, um, you know, and that both creates a challenging dynamic for me and a wonderful dy dynamic for me. So I think, you know, everything from networking, you know, everything from understanding what you don't want to do, uh, you know, that is equally important, uh, you know, to, and if not more important to understanding what you do want to do. Um, I think also being patient, right? Like, you know, I think it's very easy, you know, in the college environment, in the academic environment to get frustrated and to want to, you know, speed things up, right? One of the stories that I didn't share is that, you know, I, because I did so many internships um, for credit, uh, I could have graduated uh, a semester early, you know, but I had that same conversation with my dad where he was like, listen, you're, you've got 40 years of your life to work, like just hang out, like enjoy it, right? You know, those five months, whatever, however long, you know, a college semester is, you know, it will fly by and <laughs> you will be furious if you, you know, if you look back and leave early, right? So I think it's equal parts also, enjoy the time you have, make the most of it, um, but always have an eye for the future. Um, and yeah, you know, just be hungry to understand what it is you want to do is what I would say. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. So let's do a creative, we got time for two more questions. So sure. let's do um, a fun question. Let's see. Um, This, this one uh, goes back to disconnecting that you talked about. With some push towards disconnecting from media and reconnecting with each other and with nature, where do you see the future of digital and social media marketing going? Oh, man. <laughs> um, all right, so check out, check out my latest LinkedIn post. That's not a plug to go follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I literally shared about four hours ago uh, a post that pulled a quote from Christy Teigen, ignoring what you think about her as a human being, um, where she shared that she's leaving Twitter. Um, and she said something to the effect of, you know, it's gotten to the point now where my involvement in Twitter is more negative than positive, and that's probably a good time to leave. Um, and my reflection on that was, um, I think that's how a lot of us feel that work in social media. Um, it is a more negative place than it is positive in a lot of cases. Um, that's mostly in the comments. Um, and that right now is okay-ish, but I think long-term is going to be a problem. Um, what happens and how that plays out, I don't know outside of, I expect to see a slow, if not somewhat accelerated towards say the end of the year type drop off from those traditional platforms from the average human being. Um, you know, if not the larger content creators that bring in a lot of that audience, right? You know, uh, I'm sure there's, you know, several thousands of people that joined Twitter to follow Christy Teigen, right? Sounds absurd, but that's probably reality. She had, you know, millions upon millions of followers. Um, I, you know, on the flip side, right, there's, and I, I use this in a few other presentations that, you know, there are some channels on TikTok uh, and creators on TikTok that like are the most heartfelt, most positive, most inspirational sources of content out there, right? And one of them is, I can't remember what it is, but basically this one guy asks, um, are you happy? Mm -hmm. And that is a deep question to ask in a 60 second video format, but my God, does it bring out, and it, he mostly posts the positive stuff. Um, certainly not the damaging stuff. You know, some, if it, if it, some of it is negative, it, it spins positive. Um, that is wildly powerful, right? And that, it, that is there because that platform enables that reach and enables that sort of soapbox, um, right? And there's there's also, you know, there's uh, 
I'm pretty sure he's a therapist. Um, there's a therapist who does great sort of affirmation-esque content on TikTok. And it's wildly positive and wildly supportive. And, you know, a lot of sort of good affirmations in all the right healthy ways. Um, so, you know, I think there's twofold. I think you're going to see a lot of drop off on traditional platforms. I think brands need to do a better job of understanding that they probably need to stop selling to some extent or lessen the sell on social. And certainly brands like us need to focus on <coughs> doing more good, um, right? Social good, if you will. Um, and then I think, you know, the, those platforms that have a, have a genuine positive place to play will continue to shine and shine. Mm -hmm. So the final question this evening is, what is the most impressive thing you have seen built out of Legos? Oh man, the most impressive thing. I mean, you have to understand I work, our office, like my desk is above our model shop where we have six master model builders that are building the life-size models that you see at like Comic-Con or like, you know, the life-size Thanos or, you know, a, a life-size um, Corvette or that sort of stuff. The craziest thing I've ever seen is probably from a fan and uh, they are called GBRs, uh, Great Ball, no, GBCs, uh, Great Ball Contraptions. Um, so go onto YouTube and type in Lego GBCs. Um, and they are the craziest Rue Goldberg-esque technic engineered things ever. They're nuts. I don't even, I can't even fathom having the brain power to produce something like that. But um, yeah, uh, GBCs are what I think are some of the craziest things that people have ever built. Um, yeah, highly recommend that. That's awesome. I will be checking that out. <laughs> Um, that was our last question. I'm going to pass it over to Sandy to do closing remarks. James, I can't even tell you how wonderful it's been to have you. I enjoyed our discussion and the Q&A session. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks so much. Big thank you to James Gregson for your time and insights and to Dr. Leanne Walker for hosting this event this evening. Don't forget to register for our next virtual event on April 14th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time titled Magical Marketing, the Disney Career Journey with Kathleen Hill, Marketing Strategy Manager for Walt Disney World. The registration link is in the chat. For anyone who is not currently a student or if you're an alum who'd like to pursue your next degree at CSC Global, you can use the code LEGO, L-E-G-O, which will waive your application fee. And that concludes our career success webinar this afternoon. Thank you to all our viewers for joining us. We hope you found the conversation inspiring. On behalf of everyone at Colorado State University Global, thank you and please have a great rest of your evening. Bye everybody. Bye James.